Yeah, good morning all. Um, I'm going here to present the Prep for Blue Stakeholder Engagement Webinar Series. And we start with the first webinar entitled Bridging Mission Stakeholder Engagement Strategies for Climate Change Adaptation and Ocean Initiatives. I introduce Lucia uh, later on. Uh, first, I'd like to give you for, because um, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Mission Ocean and Waters. So uh, this is an initiative from the Prep for Blue project, um, which uh, includes uh, 17 partners from eight European countries. Um, in 2022, uh, the European Commission launched the Horizon Europe missions, which are five missions um, that aims to solve uh, key problems uh, in the society. Those are the mission cancer, the mission climate neutral and smart cities, uh, the mission soil and the mission oceans and water. So during this presentation today, uh, Lucia will link two of those missions, which are the uh, climate adapt and the ocean and waters mission. Um, the mission restore our oceans and waters uh, have three main objectives. Those are protect and restore marine and freshwater ecosystems and biodiversity prevent and eliminate pollution of our oceans, seas and waters, and make the sustainable economy carbon neutral and circular. It has also two enablers, which are the digital and water knowledge system and the public mobilization and engagement uh, within which these seminars, uh, this series of seminars uh, is included. So as you can imagine, uh, those objectives aim to, for 20, 30 and they are quite um, difficult to achieve uh, well, or challenging, I'll say, uh, because there are specific objectives like reduce by at least 50% plastic litter at sea or protect a minimum, a minimum of 30% of the EU's area. Um, this project uh, belongs to the first implementation phase of the mission uh, and it will run till 2025. Uh, regarding these uh, cross-cutting enablers for the mission, uh, one is the digital ocean uh, and the other is the public mobilization and engagement within, as I said, this series of webinars are included. Um, so, because the mission aims to get into the regional and local implementation, uh, set up five mission lighthouses in different sea bases. Those are the Atlantic and Arctic, the Baltic and North Sea, the Danube and the Black Sea, and the Mediterranean Sea. And for each of these, at the moment, set up a link, one specific of the objectives. So, for the Atlantic and Arctic, is protect and restore the the aquatic ecosystems. Uh, similar for the Danube and the Black Sea, protect and restore the ecosystems. For the Baltic and the North Sea is make the blue economy carbon neutral and circular. And for the Mediterranean, prevent and eliminate pollution. So the mission lighthouses are sites to test, demonstrate and deploy the mission activities across the EU seas and river basins. And the objective of this webinar series is to provide uh, solutions in stakeholder engagement uh, for any people, for all the people working on, on this series of projects. Um, regarding the stakeholder engagement, we have within the Prep for Blue project some results already, so I'm inviting you to please visit the website and, and see uh, what other resources there are in there, because um, this series of webinars are based in a previous one uh, about uh, citizen engagement and you can have the you can watch all the webinars in this link and within the prep for blue project we would like to do a 
definition, the difference between citizen, which emphasizes the non-specialist nature of individuals, and they engage as individuals non representing any organization or common interest, and a an stakeholder, which represents a common interest for a particular group. And they, they can be specialists, experts, or, or have any access to the mission ocean activities due to their employment, their job, or some other form. Um, so there are certain overlapping over the two concepts, but both have specific approaches which are worth it to take into, into account. Um, this slide is a bit, um, has a lot of information. Um, the idea is to give a map of the main groups of stakeholders and interest in relation to the ocean knowledge. It's based on the uh, five elix and has three main ecosystems, which are the governance ecosystem, the knowledge ecosystem, and the socioeconomical ecosystem. So try to interrelate the, the relationship between the different groups of stakeholders. So in the governments, in the governance, we have decision makers and funding organizations which main activity is to do policy and, and funding projects and so on. The knowledge ecosystem uh, divides in the knowledge owners and the knowledge providers, and the main responsibilities provide training and data. And the socioeconomical system, which divides in citizens and civil society organizations and business and industry and they have needs and they are looking for solutions. So the red spiral between them is because there are natural relationships between each of those ecosystems, but there are also a kind of interaction between all of the three um, ecosystems. So, the objective of those series is just try to well, uh, provide solutions to people working in the ocean and water mission projects, as I said before, and try to well, mm, cover uh, the, the different levels of engagement. So I'm sure that many of you of the, aud of the audience here today uh, have some kind of experience in stakeholder engagement um, and that's why you're here today. Um, so maybe you are already familiar with, with this slide in which we have four levels of engagement for stakeholders. The first one is inform and is goes in a single direction. Um, usually uh, oh, a project People from working in a project uh, use different tools to communicate with the public or the stakeholders in this case, in this case, and include techniques like newsletters, um, meetings and conferences, social media, the website, which is key. Um, and then we have the second level, which is a consult in where we are looking to obtain stakeholders' feedback, so other kind of techniques uh, can be implemented, like interviews or um, polls, surveys. Then we have the, the one that has a greater level of communication, with, uh, which is involve and collaborate in which partners with key stakeholders and diverse activities design and implement solutions. And the, the higher level, which is empowered with the stakeholders, in which stakeholders have the final decisions making. So with those concepts on the table, uh, I just wanted to remind you that this is the first a webinar in the series that in a couple of weeks uh, 
is here, is a mistake, is the 17th of July. Sorry about that. On Wednesday, the 17th, we have the second uh, webinar entitled From Stakeholders Engagement to Policy, Assessing the Marine Biodiversity Value. Uh, so today, I'm going to give the floor to Lucia Fragalago, who is the coordinator of the Galicia Demonstrator in the Transformer Project. She is the um, coordinator as well of the training department at the SETMAR, the Technological Center of the Sea, held in Galicia. And she is, as I said before, linking two of the missions, uh, which is the Climate Adapt and the Restore Our Water Emissions. So, Lucia, uh, I'm, giving, I'm giving you the floor now. I'm happy to have you here today. With you now, um, my my presentation. And as uh, Susana pointed before, our objective is to demonstrate the potential of these co-innovation processes for climate change adaptation within the context of mission restore our oceans and waters. So we are going to introduce um, uh, a decision-making assessment tool that uh, has been imp implemented by the Transformar project to meet local and sectoral needs. Um, I will start to make a short reflection about the main common features uh, that uh, in uh, when addressing uh, climate change and uh, restoring oceans that can require common approaches. On one hand, um, in both cases, we are tackling um, a challenge which has a multi-sectoral and a transboundary nature. That, in, in, yeah, that means that we, we are going to need for complex governing actions. Um, the responsibilities are not always clearly defined. We just have to think, for instance, uh, in the case of the uh, ocean activities, uh, when we go through the responsibilities towards the spaces in the ocean or the multi-spatial planning. Uh, and the same applies for climate change. And often they require responses from many levels of government the private sector, the civil society, citizens, in different levels, but they must go in the same direction. Um, the multi-level governance system uh, is um, really a, a common feature. Uh, policy responses should combine global and local levels. Uh, in the case of um, uh, climate change, uh, the, the way they, they saw, um, it said that mitigation is global, adaptation is local, we could think on a similar way when we are tackling uh, ocean um, restoration and uh, activities addressing the, uh, the mission ocean. We have uh, a lot of decisions that should be taken in the global scale, but the day-to-day -day is run on a local uh, level. And those cascading decisions are involving individuals and public bod bodies at local and regional and national scale. So, and even more uh, uh, in, in some cases, we uh, can even have the international scale. And it's also very important to, to point that in both cases, in many um, cases, we have an insufficient knowledge to support the decision making. And uh, we have on one hand to continuously update the scientific information, this is very relevant, but also we have to manage uncertainty. And all participants in decision making processes should be prepared to manage the, this uncertainty. And um, this uh, well, is like a framework to, to consider this uh, approach. In both cases, again, it's very important to take into account the social and ecological context, including historical, political, economic and underlying system attributes. So in this case, 
I will present an activity that has been developed in Galicia. And um, we uh, always uh, present our region as one uh, of the most important fishing regions in the European Union. And this is key again because of uh, the fact, uh, uh, the way of the, the population perceives all the challenges related to fishing or shell fishing. You can see in the map the total uh, fishery sector employment in Europe, and we are here in black in uh, the northwest of Spain. We can see here in detail uh, the RIA, which is quite close to an estuary in which uh, we are developing our activity, which is the RIA de Aros. Yeah, here, um, one of the um, uh, areas of the uh, most important production of mussels in, in Europe. Our study case is, uh, what, what I'm going to present today, is the adaptation of the Transformark playbook by the Galicia demonstrator in the Transformark project to design a climate change adaptation pathway for the mussel and clam culture, which in the context of Transformark are uh, considered as a um, key community systems. This involves all the um, stakeholders involved in, in this um, activity. This work, uh, this adaptation has been developed uh, with the collaboration of uh, CETMAR, the, um, uh, um, the Technology Center for the Sea, um, and the University of Vigo, with uh, two groups uh, work, uh, working with, with us, uh, the group Rede and um, in Geoma, uh, one of them is addressing social economy and the other uh, geology and environment, uh, marine environment, with the contribution of the Institute of Marine Research um, um, here in uh, in Vigo again. So our demonstrator, what we are uh, working at, uh, continue to to present, which is the community in which we have uh, adapted our activity. Um, it's addressing mussel aquaculture and clam culture and shell fishing on food. And in both cases, we can uh, describe them as traditional sectors uh, led by a family by a family economy and mainly with self-employed uh, people. There are also enterprises, especially in the mussel um, uh, uh, community system. Uh, but we can uh, uh, um, see, say that there is a, a lot of family economy. For the mussel aquaculture, it's about 40% uh, of the European production, uh, which is distributed in more than 3,000 floating rafts, and it directly employs more than 5,000 persons. And in the case of the clam culture and shell fishing on foods, there are about 600 clam culture farms and about 3,500 self-employed harvesters on foot, which are mainly women. Um, as you can see, there are very small farms and uh, because it's uh, quite um, uh, divided uh, and the, the farms are maybe from one or two persons or a family. They are uh, the main challenges that uh, are being addressed in, in the project are um, because there, there are risks related to climate change, related to changes in hydrographic conditions, uh, increasing of harmful, uh, harmful algal blooms, extreme weather events, and uh, the risk of loss of habitats. And in our demonstrator, we are uh, testing uh, some solutions related with the intelligent and strategic mussel aquaculture, knowledge tools for clam harvesting and culture, and we are also testing insurance and funding. But um, what I'm going to present here is what, how are we applying one of the tools which is addressed at coordinating and co-creating adaptation pathways with uh, the sector which is, uh, who is involved in the, in the demonstrator. To continue giving a frame, I am sorry for that, but this helps also to understand how these uh, actions are, are addressed. Um, this is done uh, in the framework of the Transformar project, which is part of a cluster of um, for um, Green Deal projects that are supporting the uh, European climate adaptation policy. 
those projects are not directly funded under the, the uh, Horizon Europe, so they are not directly part of the mission Climate Adapt, but they are considered as early facilitators in pre-identifying and upscaling the most promising cross-sectoral solutions. So we are in very close collaboration with Climate Adapt, and indeed, the tool that I'm going to present today is already integrated in the website of Climate Adapt. And the projects are Resilience, which is the um, coordinating the three innovation actions, uh, which are Transformar, Arsinoe, and Impetus. Our tool is um, developed by the Transformar project. The three are searching for innovative solutions related to water management and adaptation to climate change. So, Transformar um, is developing six demonstrator and it has also a follower uh, region um, um, here as an associate. And um, it's um, developing um, solutions um, and testing methodologies um, for this adaptation to climate change in the water management. And here you can see the Galicia demonstrator is the one that I just uh, briefly presented. One of the common tools that is being used is this playbook on resilience pathways development. And uh, here you have also the link to the uh, section in which is also described in the um, Climate Adapt uh, um, website. Oops, sorry. What is this playbook? It's uh, both an interactive PDF uh, guidebook and a web tool. The web tool is in beta phase uh, that um, guides uh, step by step uh, to co-construct an adaptation pathway. Um, it uh, helps the moderators to organize um, interactive sessions that may be uh, online or in person. I will, we will just also present uh, our experience with these two methodologies. And uh, it gives an overview of the essential tools that may be uh, needed to design uh, this adaptation pathway. It's uh, also useful uh, and it can be used by many different uh, uh, organizations and groups of organizations. And also, it's uh, very adaptable. Indeed, it has um, ideas and, uh, and tools, but it can be uh, really adapted. One of the main characteristics is that co-creation and stakeholder engagement is at the core of this approach. In our case, uh, we have reached 30 organizations representing private sectors, um, and sectoral associations and fisher guilds, in our case, non-governmental -government, organizations, edu the education community, administrations and policy makers, and the scientific community. And to facilitate this connection of so different actors in this co-creation of uh, action, uh, it's, um, let's say, we uh, the pathways are supported and uh, and accepted by the local community, and it's um, very uh, qualitative in some, sem uh, in some sense, even though it's al always based in uh, scientific criteria. So we are, let's say, simplifying to facilitate the integration of the scientific cr criteria. Um, there is, it's less data intensive. Uh, they are more qualitative input, inputs uh, than, than in other type of tools. And the effort is placed on considering stakeholders' per perception, awareness, pedagogy, and a positive narrative and visioning, via, via, visioning of the transformative adaptation. There is a step-by-step -step guidance and detailed materials and canvases and instructions that are also available to be used and adapted. Um, these adaptation pathways uh, are sequences of actions which can be implemented progressively depending on future dynamics. And this is also 
a system to manage this uncertainty because in many cases we it's quite complex to determine thresholds to start applying some solution. Oops. So the methodology is based on three participatory workshop sessions. Session one address climate perception, challenges and solutions. And in, this, um, the, and in this session, the scientific baseline is presented to discuss priorities of local stakeholders. Um, it's important to point that uh, the process involves both the scientific and local knowledge, because in many cases, uh, locals can uh, very um, complement very well the scientific knowledge with uh, their own um, knowledge from the, the activity they are doing day to day. Session two is addressed to determining risk evolution indicators and critical thresholds. And session three is addressed to develop a vision, uh, solutions and a way forward. This is in the theory, and this is what you will find in the, um, in the playbook. The idea is that sessions could be run independently because they require some time and online as well as in person. Uh, there were some developed online uh, in the framework of the, of the project. But as said before, it's quite important to adapt to the uh, specific needs of each uh, group so I will show a little bit how is it, what you will find. The process starts by listing the adaptation risk and thresholds, the viability of solutions again, against each date of the actions. Uh, it colors them and develop pathways. Then a selection of adaptation pathways is conducted. The main canvas, uh, the tool includes um, examples of um, canvas or uh, let's say um, materials that can be used for the different sessions with questions and ideas of thresholds. Normally, uh, this is adapted by the transformer team and then filled by the participants in these three sessions. Oops, sorry. This is what can be found here in, in the documents. And I will just uh, now present how have we adapted this playbook methodology to the Galician context. Our primary purpose was to identify strategic priorities and focus our efforts when adapting the muscle and clam culture to climate change. And this has involved local and regional stakeholders in the co-development of innovative solutions. But we started uh, in a different way. We started uh, with uh, bilateral visits uh, to the main stakeholders that we would like to mobilize. This was like an icebreaker. We wanted to identify contributors and promote confidence. And in those sessions, we also could have a very open uh, communication about their perception of climate change, resources that could be shared with us, and also um, the perceptions towards the other stakeholders. In some cases, um, we are addressing two um, communities that are um, uh, using the same space, and in some cases, there, there are differences in the way they perceive the, the impact of the other community and so on. So this was very helpful to create co uh, confidence. It may happen also that uh, we aim to address an organization, but in some, uh, we also want to address in some cases different levels of representation in the organization. It's very good to have the um, head of the fishermen guild on board, but sometimes it's very, uh, they do not have time enough to participate in many events. So it's good to have some of them, but in some cases it can be very good to have an intermediate position that is used to work with scientific uh, information, but also to communicate it to the people working in the fishermen guild. Once we've had our, our map of the main actors, 
uh, we promoted the first uh, workshop. Indeed, the first workshop was done in parallel with the bilateral visits, and it was done uh, online in the first moment because we were a little bit pushed by the project because we needed to have some uh, first results uh, in, in a rapid way. So we tried to introduce Pete to the pro, uh, to the process by inviting those that were already vi visited in a, in a in a first workshop. Uh, I should say that we had a limited success, <laughs> and participants uh, requested an in-person approach. Uh, so it was somehow useful for the purpose of uh, speeding the process, but also for um, putting very clear that it was better to have some time and and dedicate uh, and have the possibility to 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 make uh, this interaction uh, in person so after this uh, first uh, step uh, we developed two more in person workshops the first of them addressed uh, sessions 2 and 3 uh, from the playbook uh, indeed, we consider that the first bilateral visits and the first workshop was addressing uh, session one, and we could have a good baseline. So we addressed those the rest of the sessions in the first workshop. Uh, we had limited time. We were um, uh, we joined for about four to five uh, hours uh, in the in the process. More more four than five because there, there were times also for coffees and, and stops. Um, and participants requested a, a more sessions. So we developed this second uh, workshop in which we could review and discuss uh, um, on the proposed solutions of the first workshop. And also in, we introduced a gaming approach to integrate the need for cooperation. Sorry. So in workshop one, we started with a scientific presentation of 20 minutes in which we address the risk and threats for both muscle and clan cultures. Uh, and then uh, we had debates and discussion in groups during four hours and participants were invi uh, invited during the process to a coffee break and a meal. They were not receiving any funding for attending the, the activity, but uh, we were based in a specific estuary, so we uh, went there to organize this um, this um, uh, workshop. So in the debates, they discussed about the most prominent risks that were pre-identified in the scientific presentation, but they started working on indicators and critical thresholds to act when uh, uh, when we have a, a, an important impact. Then we continued by working on adaptation proposals and we did a first prioritization of those to get a list of solutions for Galicia. Uh, with this process, we obtained 36 solutions uh, and they were classified uh, in terms of uh, if they were addressing governance and management policies, communication and awareness raising, technical and engineering solutions, nature-based solutions, and research and innovation. And with this information, we grouped them in 18 solutions, which were uh, more easy to manage, and also we uh, sometimes solutions are proposed by different groups or different persons, so we could merge some of the solutions that were reported. It's very important that in every phase, we share the results with the group. So the report of the workshop together with the developments that were done afterwards, this grouping of solutions were shared with the, all participants. So in workshop two, uh, Indeed, well, uh, we developed this workshop to six months after. So we consider that it was important to start again with the updated scientific presentation. We updated, it was not the same uh, from what was presented before, but um, it was the same content uh, with an adaptation. <coughs> this was considered very important for two reasons. 
one, not forget the baseline uh, in, uh, that was the first uh, um, line that we had addressed, update the, the information we had and also update the people. Sometimes it's not the same person from the same organization that is attending. So this is important also to have more or less the same basis. Even if they have the same the report from the first uh, meeting and they have the recording to the video of the first presentation. So then we have a, um, um, a first debating groups in which we could review the adaptation proposals that we had from the previous workshop and a role play game that was addressed also to uh, facilitate a second prioritization and um, put more emphasis in the need to join efforts among the different stakeholders groups. So uh, again, uh, participants were invited to a coffee break and a meet. Uh, this second prioritization was used for a road development of our roadmap. But uh, the fact is that the, uh, the, the workshops do not have time enough to really think a lot uh, on, on the results. I give some information about uh, how we work with the game. Uh, we had also groups uh, organized representing the production environment uh, for muscle, for clam, the social environment, administrative environment, and scientific environment. Not all the participants were really part of this group in the real life, but uh, some of them were. Indeed, we try to mix the real life uh, participants and uh, sometimes uh, they, they had to, to play. And they received a selection of solutions to review and discuss, addressing two questions. What would be needed to apply solutions as soon as possible? Considering urgency, but also the facility to apply the solution. And what resources can be offered as a group to carry out the proposal? The game had three parts. Uh, on one hand, the group worked on the say, uh, working work on on a selection of um, solutions to prioritize them by internally in each group, and uh, they were already thinking in what do they what is needed for the solution and what can be offered. In the second part, there were was interaction among groups, and they had to search for. Uh, the needs they could not tackle themselves to implement the solution. And finally, uh, there was a presentation and conclusions. To be able to, um, to, to, to win in the, in the game, uh, we needed that each group uh, to implement at least one solution. Uh, if each group implemented one solution, we had one row in the general panel and uh, there was, uh, um, we avoided a 10% loss on the production. Uh, we got about uh, two solutions implemented by all the groups, but indeed we had a block catch because we had uh, a lot of difficulties uh, with um, to, uh, the social environment group, had a lot of difficulties to get accepted their solutions and the, what they were requesting. What is important here is the limiting factor is time and the collaboration between groups and teamwork are the most important factors. Um, the game was very well accepted. Uh, the, the participants said that the division by sector was useful and uh, indeed the game was developed smoothly and in a friendly atmosphere. It allows, this gaming allows to make actions uh, without the pressure of being uh, working seriously, but it makes reflection, reflections in some aspects that are key when we, we go, we have to take the decisions in the real life. And uh, well, they consider that this had to reach concrete conclusions and show the steps for implementation, even though some people consider it too complex and maybe it needs some further simplification. This is the type of result we could have 
when we put in order the prioritization on the solutions uh, they they had and they had proposed uh, the 18 climate adaptation solutions and well this is what the playbook considers that uh, you will obtain after this uh, workshop 3 this is to be worked by the um, in, people uh, implementing the solution. They have to review the solutions table, review the project guidelines to design the pathways, and then design those pathways, considering urgency, relevance, social environmental acceptance, effectiveness, feasibility, and contribution to climate mitigation. This is an example how we are working. I will go a little bit rapid because we spent, I spent a lot of time speaking scores we did in our um, different type of solutions and the final proposal for an action plan indicating time frame stakeholders to be involved monitoring indicator key enablers and existing programs or strategies to which the action will contribute so there is a lot of information on these methodologies which are very um uh, they, they are addressing the climate change but they can be very inspiring when we are going to work with stakeholders on the ocean um, emission and uh, this is all from my side thank you very much thank you lucia i think that's very very interesting um you can start uh, doing any question if you have any questions for Lucia or to myself today. If not, I have a very clear uh, question here. Well, I have a couple of them. So while people is writing some of them, um, I start asking uh, how people from muscle and clam are receiving the scientific information. Uh, they were aware of the climate change, uh, risks or problems that they can arise, or how okay. they receive that feedback? Uh, what was challenging indeed was to make a very short presentation of a very complex um, um, problem. Uh, having into account the fact that we had on one hand people uh, with um, uh, which is not used to receive uh, these type of presentations and to analyze these type of problems with a scientific perspective, but they, they are very aware of, of what is happening in their places and they, they gave us a lot of information uh, related to climate change when we visited them, but they give you that in another form. The local knowledge is presented in a different uh, way. And we had to adapt this with people that were working every day in climate change adaptation. Uh, our success factor in this case is to have uh, um, on board a scientist capable to adapt the language of the presentation and the level of the presentation to so different contexts. And in 20 minutes, uh, he was able to present uh, the problem in a very clear way. And uh, the challenges and, and, the, and, the, and the baseline, ev everything in a very clear way. And from my point of view, the, one of the best uh, comments uh, we received on that first workshop was from one Fisher, uh, um, uh, head of one of the fishermen guilds. He was just named uh, a couple of months ago and he said well i'm not used to this type of activities and when i came i thought this will be the horror five hours here mm -hmm. and then it finalized so rapidly uh, i want to continue doing this type of things <laughs> uh, this was the uh, some of the reactions so this is also the reason for putting always this scientific presentation at the beginning because it also helps to have all of us the same information. So that's great that, that the feedback from the, the participants were so uh, nice. Um, how they react to the game methodology because they are <laughs> adults and maybe, I don't know. 
Yes, uh, we um, had uh, some fear on how people would react uh, to this methodology. And uh, the, the case was that uh, everyone reacted quite uh, well. Indeed, for the game, uh, we had more fear with uh, the administrators than maybe than with the um, people from, from the guilds, but maybe anyone can be uh, keen to play or not. At the end, everybody played. We had even someone from one enterprise that arrived just in the moment we launched the game, in the middle of the workshop, <laughs> and uh, that had not participated in the previous activities. And it was one, a very good player indeed. He fostered a lot of uh, communication in, uh, in between the groups. Um, it was, it was interesting. Uh, we had, in some moment, we have to stress them that, okay, it's a serious game. Uh, you have to play, not only speak uh, one to the other, but it was well received. And at the end, it reflected something that is happening in real life. Because uh, no, most of the group had not thought that they needed the society for implementing the solutions. And only, uh, and also the society uh, group had much more difficulties to get implemented some of the solutions they had to 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 implement, and we we could reflect on that because it was a game, but it reflected something that uh, people see also in in real life. Okay. Someone from the audience uh, would like to do any questions. We can, you can open the camera and micro if you want. The, uh... I, uh, we have a question from Ainsworth Gillian, uh, and he says, uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Did the participants identify any stakeholders who they would like to interact with, but who are not involved in the workshop or the role playing game? And maybe a policy makers on uh, this is. Mm, for this question, if you would like to open uh, your mic and camera, you can do it yourself or add anything. You're very welcome. It happens sometimes. We received, uh, for instance, um, especially during the um, bilateral meetings, we received orientations on involving um, other stakeholders, for instance, with the operators uh, sector on the for the uh, shellfish. They were not participating in the workshops and they were requested in some some moments. Sometimes it's not easy to have everybody on board. There we have sometimes also people that are following the process but not taking part actively. It happened uh, with some administrations, for instance, and we try to transmit this uh, to the audience uh, every every time. But uh, yes, we received some comments on it would be uh, worthy to involve this group or this person. And it helps in, in many cases, because uh, in, in some cases, it, it helps to identify a person sensitive to the problem uh, with interest in dedicating some time and representing a specific sector. I'm curious because um, when you think about this, um, People working uh, on the on this aquaculture sector usually uh, they don't care too much about um, well data or results of a, a scientific project. So when do you do the reports of the meetings and send to them? Do you re receive feedback? Yes, indeed, uh, we receive feedback, uh, and uh, not everybody reads the reports and, and gives a very concrete feedback, but there is a percentage that does, and they give uh, good uh, feedback. And there is also there are also organizations that share this information in between their associates. So, in our opinion, the fact of giving the feedback, even if not everybody is reading it, it's important also to keep them on board and interested on in continuing because they have also a sign of the fact that this is being used and that they can use also the information and the results. Also, we invite them to correct the versions if they are not uh, reflecting what they wanted to, to present. And we also receive some feedback in, in this sense. So we, we would 
we, we encourage uh, people to, to do these uh, feedback actions because in many cases, even if it's written in the idea, first ideas, in many cases, this is lost. And, and it's useful uh, to, to, to keep the people uh, on board participating. Great. Thank you very much, Lucia, for your uh, collaboration today. Uh, congratulations for the successful implementation of these cooperational um, initiatives. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, please, if you are interested in the next webinar, um, you can register already. Um, you have the information here in the chat. And also, I'd like to say that um, in order to improve next editions of the webinars, uh, we are we will be very happy if you can take some of your time to answer an uh, evaluation survey for this webinar. Uh, I think that we are on time. If anyone wants to add something, you are welcome. If not... I think that we can close this. Thank you very much.